This is Dennis McMahon, and welcome to Positively Vermont. And today we are going to be speaking with Ryan Bliss, the president of the Vermont Aviators Association, about a very exciting group involved in some extremely exciting projects in our state. Uh, and uh, welcome, Ryan. Thank you for having me, Dennis. Really appreciate it and look forward to speaking with you today. Well, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, you know, who you are, where you live, and how you became involved in the world of aviation. Sure. So uh, my wife and I are both uh, born and bred New Englanders. I grew up on Cape Cod. I was born in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. My wife is from uh, the Foster Gloucester uh, area of Rhode Island in the northwest corner. And uh, we met in Boston. Um, we've, we've lived in New Hampshire, Massachusetts, South Carolina, and just recently moved to Vermont uh, because we love it here so much. And we've been here for a little over a year and uh, we absolutely love it. Um, the people here are great, the activities are great, the aviation community is amazing. So uh, we've been here a little over a year, really loving the state and everything it has to offer. Uh, as far as how we got into aviation, I started, I took my first flight lesson in January of 2018 in Nashua, New Hampshire, at Nashua Airport. And uh, it was a life-changing event. It was um, the most fun thing I've ever done. And ever since that's, what I want to do every single day and share it with everybody else. So what we're doing as an organization now is we formed a 501c3 nonprofit educational organization called the Vermont Aviators Association. And our goal is to bring um, aviation education um, uh, community and, um, and jobs and careers and everything like that together. And so we want to basically share aviation with the community. And it's a much bigger picture than that sounds. So we are doing events to invite the community down to the local airports to get some great food at the food trucks, go for helicopter rides, um, meet flight instructors, sit in planes, all of those kind of things, which is great. But um, we're doing even more to promote aviation education, STEM careers, um, you know, and, and expansion of the uh, aviation sector to the community so that people can feel comfortable and um, in coming down to the airport and um, you know talking to people and really just hanging out, enjoying everything that the airport has to offer. So uh, we're also looking to work with uh, VTrans, uh, Vermont Agency of Transportation, to improve the maintenance and care of the airports. We have a number of airports that have uh, really suffered due to lack of maintenance over the years. So we want to improve that because it really affects the economy in Vermont. For example. You know, if um, at Middlebury Airport in Middlebury, Vermont, currently the uh, fuel station is uh, is down. So they've had an experience where the um, the fuel farm was not maintained properly. Now there's sediments and other particulates in the fuel, which make it unusable. And so nobody's going to that airport to buy fuel anymore. Um, so the state currently hasn't done anything to fix that. We're trying to get them to to do that, but all that revenue that would go to the state of Vermont. Now everyone is flying to Ticonderoga in New York to get fuel. So we're losing out as a state on that revenue and tax revenue um, that people probably don't even know about. So there's a lot of things behind the scenes that are really important to make the Vermont's revenue, economy, jobs, education sector as vibrant and as um, thriving as they possibly can be. So we're working on all those fronts. Um, but what people probably see, you know, um, about us the most is the events that we do where we have, you know, the food trucks, the airplanes, the helicopters, just really fun days for the family to take their kids down to the airport for three or four hours and really enjoy the airport. But from a big picture, you know, we are looking into and working on a lot of different areas of the Vermont aviation sector. There are a lot of resources uh, that uh, you can tap into. We can discuss that uh later on about the aviation scene, but if you could just give uh, our viewers an idea of what the aviation picture is in New York. How many, I mean, in Vermont, uh, what kind of uh, airports we have, and facilities, and uh, I know we have Burlington International, but just give us an, an overall uh, uh, view of, of what kind of resources there are in Vermont. Well, so Vermont is is really like an amazing state for aviation. The history of Vermont uh, aviation is is really deep. Uh, Charles Lindbergh has been to the various airports in Vermont. Caledonia um, has had some amazing milestones in aviation going back 100 years. Uh, Caledonia Airport. 
And so the resources here are just unbelievable. The people, the airports, the types of services that a lot of uh, pilots volunteer for that people probably don't even know about. You know, just as an example, Dennis, um, there are organizations in the general aviation community where uh, pilots like myself and my, my friends, they actually will volunteer their time and their aircraft and the cost of everything um, for those flights to fly folks that maybe live in rural areas and can't get to a hospital in a city, like say Boston, if they need to go to Dana-Farber or uh, down to Yale for some kind of treatment, but they can't get there. They don't have the car or the means to get there. There's organizations that will fly up to their little tiny airport in their rural uh, towns, pick them up, fly them to Yale, fly them to Boston um, so that they can have their medical appointments. And this is all volunteer uh, services. And this happens a lot in the state of Vermont. So these Airports are really important. We also have organizations that, again, are just volunteers where um, they rescue dogs and cats, you know, from different parts of the country where they find homes for these animals, but they may be 100, 200, 500 miles from where the animal is located. So there's organizations where pilots will volunteer to fly down to pick up the animals, fly them to their new home homeowners, uh, to their new owner's uh, location to drop them off. And so there's a lot of things that people may just not be aware of that happen behind the scenes. And it's all from a volunteer team of aviators that volunteer their time, their aircraft and um, their, their money to pay for these things. So it's not something you see in the news, but it happens all the time. General aviation is also huge with um, volunteering to um, respond to emergencies. So anytime there's a hurricane or tornadoes or any kind of devastating events in the US, the general aviation community rallies to get um, items needed for those areas to uh, recuperate and for, for the folks that need help. And constantly, there's a constant stream of general aviation pilots flying their planes loaded with supplies to all these little tiny airports to help people in those kind of circumstances. So even though folks may not be aware of that, it's not in the news, there's a lot of stuff that happens at these little tiny airports in Vermont and everywhere else in the country that is really valuable to the residents and citizens, as well as jobs, you know, um, education and, uh, and rev taxable revenue as well. It's amazing. Well, you know, there might be an image that people will have about a private pilot being an incredibly wealthy guy or some yeah. kind of important person or someone associated with the military or the government. Tell us uh, if this uh, field is open to uh, more people than those who are professionals. Or, and, and how does one start? Look, someone's going to be watching this video uh, on television and they're going to be wanting to, uh, I, that might interest me. Maybe you could take us through some of those aspects of, of your association. Yeah, that, you bring up a really great point, Dennis. I would say the general community that's not involved in general aviation has a conception that um, you know, you have to be a billionaire or a millionaire in order to fly airplanes. And the reality is that's just not true. You can buy an airplane, a functional safe airplane from anywhere in the range of 10 to $15,000 up to, you know, just imagine a, a millions of dollars and everything in between. But if you're driving a Toyota Camry, a Ford F-150, you know, a minivan that's been built in the last five or 10 years, you can buy an airplane for the same price. Um, you know, we have a number of aircraft at our airport that were purchased for twenty-five to thirty-five thousand dollars, and so you know that that is disposable income, obviously. So um, you do need to have some disposable income, but you don't have to be a millionaire or a billionaire. Another affordable way to learn how to fly is by joining a flying club. People probably aren't aware of this, but um, if you join a flying club, the beautiful you know thing of, about that from a financial perspective is you spread the operating costs in insurance and everything, all of those costs for the aircraft amongst 15 people. So uh, it's a very affordable way to fly. The most expensive part of flying is, is buying and maintaining an aircraft. So if you're part of a club and you can spread that amongst 15 different people, you've reduced your costs significantly. And generally for a nonprofit flying club, you know, most of what you're paying for is fuel. So you, you have to pay for the fuel that you use in the aircraft, and then you generally will pay a monthly due. Um, that covers the operations and maintenance for the aircraft, but it's very affordable. Um, you do have to share the plane with 14 other people. So, you know, you have to schedule it, um, you know, efficiently, but it's a way to fly in an affordable fashion. Um, and so that's something that I think is, is maybe not, um, you know, 
put out to the public enough, but you know, my goal and our goal as an organization and with a lot of the pilots across the state is to start even more flying clubs. We do have a number of flying clubs in Vermont. They'll be posted on our website once we launch that later in July. But uh, so anybody can find that information if they visit avi uh, vermontaviators.org um, once we launch the website uh, in a two or three more weeks. But, um, but just realize that's available. So if you go down to your local airport, you can ask people, hey, is there a flying club? Do you have a flight school? Are there flight instructors here? What's a cheap way to fly or an affordable way to fly? And just get in that conversation uh, or contact us. We're happy to walk people through it as well. Um, and to answer your second question, how do people get into aviation to become private pilots or commercial pilots? Um, it's pretty simple, but again, it's not one of those things that is really, I can tell you when I first started flying, yes, I, had no clue, about it. Yes. I had no clue how to schedule a lesson. I really had no idea. Um, so if it's something you want to do, you just, again, once our website is published in the next two or three weeks, all of the details of every flight school in Vermont will be on our website. But essentially what you want to do is, uh, just do a Google search, you know, flight schools, flight training in Vermont or, or in Burlington or in Rutland or Swanton, Vermont, you know, any of those types of Google searches will pop up the available flight schools. And all you have to do is just uh, give them a call and they'll, they'll be happy to schedule an introductory flight lesson with the person. And that basically is sort of an orientation lesson where the individual will come down to the airport, meet the flight instructor. Um, the flight instructor will walk them through you know, the procedure to become a private pilot, all the steps involved. Um, and then they'll take them up for usually a 30 to 60 minute um, flight with the, with the new student just to show them what it's like to fly the plane. They'll take them up, let them do some maneuvers, um, probably do an approach uh, to land, but not quite land. That takes a little more practice. Um, but uh, that's generally how you want to do it. And now the other thing, too, that's really important is there are lots of scholarships available to become private pilots, commercial pilots, to add ratings. Um, we're going to have a scholarship section on our website that people will be able to go to and they can see all the available scholarships. Um, the scholarships are not generally um, utilized as much as they should be. So it's something that we would encourage everybody to look into if you need some assistance with flight training, if that's something you want to do. Um, another thing, too, is if folks are thinking about becoming professional pilots, commercial pilots, um, there's such a massive shortage right now for commercial pilots in uh, mechanics and controllers in the U.S., that a lot of the um, airline companies will take people in right off the street uh, you know, to a certain degree, um, and they will actually put them through all the training uh, that they need to become a career professional pilot. And then, you know, at the end of that, they'll have a job. So it's, you know, it's one of those careers that is very lucrative and the demand is massive right now. And anybody can do this job. I mean, the training is amazing um, to become a pilot, the training by the airlines. So if it's something you're interested in, you should either contact us, we can help you find the appropriate people to get uh, that conversation started, or just search on your own for the airline companies that have training programs for new pilots. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I was doing my private pilot training um, with my flight instructor, Ed, he had a student who, um, young, young student, I think he was about 23 or 24. And he was about 10 hours into his private uh, pilot flight training. So only 10 hours into it. And he applied for a job at JetBlue. They interviewed him. They loved his uh, interview skills and his intelligence and, you know, everything. They hired him to come on, not to start flying for JetBlue, granted, right away, but to come on and go through their, uh, basically their college-like uh, program to become trained as a professional pilot. So um, that is something that people can do if they're interested in that. And again, we're happy to help uh, to point people in the right direction for those kind of uh, contacts and connections. That's great, because uh, I was going to ask a lot of things you already covered, which is fantastic, you know, about the opportunities, about the state of the industry, uh, the benefits of the state. And we have a, a great deal of public officials who watch this show and participate with town meeting TV and and that's good for them to know as well as for the public to know. And what I'd like, maybe uh, if you could just describe uh, your plane and your experience with it and some of the things uh, you have done uh, in your flying career, uh, that might uh, pique some more interest in getting involved. Sure. Um, so great questions. 
So uh, as far as my experience, uh, like I said, I took my first flight lesson in January of 2018. Um, and I, I have type 1 diabetes. I've had that since I was nine years old. My little brother has it as well. So getting a first class medical uh, was not really an option for me to become a commercial pilot. And now it's, it's, it's possible, but it's extraordinarily expensive and difficult to achieve. But so I got my private pilot certificate, but I fell in love with aviation so much that I wanted to change careers. I was in the medical industry for 20 years and I wanted to get into aviation because I just loved it. And so um, in July of 2019, I got my remote pilot certificate. And that's a that's basically a it's a called a part 107 certificate. And that's a commercial drone operator certificate. And so I started a drone inspection company called Infrared Aerial. And I specialized, my company specialized in doing utility scale solar plant inspections, uh, renewable energy inspections. So I purchased the drones and infrared cameras necessary to do that. And I started flying large solar plant inspections. And that was my job. I did that, you know, uh, all year long, made a, a decent living at it, um, enough to be uh, comfortable and happy. And I got to work outdoors every day and not in an office. And it was, it was just a great job. I loved it. Um, and so the, uh, over the last year, I've added an instrument rating to my private pilot certificate so that I can fly in the clouds or, um, you know, uh, fly just according to the flight instruments and not being able to see outside. So that was a big accomplishment that I did in, uh, accomplish in uh, January. Um, and as far as my plane, you know, my wife and I had been renting planes and we also joined a club, a flying club when we were living in South Carolina. But um, we bought a, we purchased a plane uh, about a year ago, a little over a year ago, and it's uh, it's a Vans aircraft, which is an experimental amateur built aircraft. Uh, it's called the RV10, so Romeo Victor 10, and um, we've been loving that plane. It's it's a four seat plane. Um, it uh, has pretty good uh, fuel uh, efficiency. Uh, it's a fairly fast plane. Um, and it can carry 1,005 pounds of people, baggage, and fuel. So we have a decent um, uh, load that we can carry with the plane to get places. We've flown it a lot around New England. So we lo love taking it for day trips to anywhere in New England, um, you know, Maine, the southern coast, uh, Lake Ithaca, different, different places. We, we have two bicycles that we um, throw in the back of the plane. And whenever we get somewhere, we don't need to rent a car or anything. So we just take the bicycles out and ride around, you know, the area, which is really fun. Um, we've flown it to Florida, you know, we're planning to take it out to the West coast, you know, later this year. Um, and so I had mentioned too, that our, our aircraft is an experimental amateur built. So there's two types, there's, there's lots of different types of planes, but there's two main categories of plane. It's certified and certified just means that the FAA has, uh, the company manufacturing the plane has put it through all of the FAA requirements to prove that it's safe and, um, you know, for, for people to fly. And then they start manufacturing it. Think of it like Ford or Chevy, you know, they, they get all the certifications done and then there's a production line that pumps out the planes and sells them. Experimental amateur built planes are a different category of plane where uh, an, an, an individual who might be inclined to building, you know, cars or, you know, anything really, um, a lot of aerospace engineers get into this where you can buy a kit plane and build it yourself. So it's not as intimidating. It is, it is a big job, but it's not as intimidating as it sounds. So most of the modern kits today are more assembly projects than actually, you know, um, creating your own scrap, you know, your own uh, parts out of scrap metal and building them and all of that. So the new, the new kit planes typically will have pre-punched holes um, and a lot of the, the work's been done and it's more of an assembly project. So our, our aircraft is an experimental amateur built. And the, the benefit of an experimental amateur build is that they are a fraction of the cost of a certified plane. And you can use a lot more equipment, avionics uh, and different materials for the plane uh, based on your, uh, what you wanna use. And typically the cost for all of the avionics and uh, equipment that you put into an experimental amateur built plane are a fraction of the cost of the certified equipment, even though they're made by the same manufacturer and they're more or less the same exact product because it's EAB, experimental amateur built, the cost is significantly lower. So for anybody that likes to build and has a garage and would be interested in putting a couple of years into it, uh, it's probably the most rewarding project you'll ever have. And the communities, the builder communities in aviation are massive. 
So you have these massive networks of other folks that have either already built planes or are currently building planes that will act as mentors and um, coaches for the people doing it for the first time. There's also a number of organizations like AOPA, uh, EAA, um, and others that will actually, they, they conduct courses all the time throughout the year where you can actually go to the course and learn how to build, play, build your own plane uh, from experts. So there's a lot of resources out there to, to kind of, you know, go on either path that you decide is best for you. That's great. Why don't you tell us about, uh, we're recording this uh, on uh, June 23rd, but you've had some uh, events in, in the last month or so. Why don't you tell us, give us a, a picture of how those events, what, what they were and what took place there. Sure. Um, so part of our statement, bringing together aviation education and community is the community end. So our events are more about bringing the local community into the, uh, to the airport and to experience all the amazing fun and what is often perceived and, and correctly so uh, off limits to the general public. You know, you can't really drive down to your local airport and just go into the, you know, go onto the other side of the fence. So we want everybody to come down to the airport, come onto the other side of the fence. Let's look at all the planes, go sit in some planes, you know, take a helicopter ride, eat some good food, um, play, play some, act, you know, games and activities that we have out for the kids. So really it's, it's, there's no um, real specific purpose. What we, ju what we just want to do is share this with everybody. We want everyone to come down and just enjoy the airport. And one of the really nice side effects of this has been, um, you know, generating a lot of interest by kids and adults to become pilots. So we've partnered with some of the major flight schools like Vermont Flight Academy. And for example, at our last event in Rutland, Vermont Flight Academy came to the event. Um, they had a table set up to speak to anybody interested in taking lessons. Uh, they also brought their Satabria, which is an aerobatic plane, tailwheel plane. It's a beautiful plane. And one of their flight instructors, Owen White, um, who was actually my instrument flight instructor, great guy, super smart, very patient, uh, great, great uh, instructor and pilot. And they were at the event and um, letting kids sit in the Satabria and talking to anybody interested in taking flying lessons. So it was just a really nice resource for people to have at the airport during our events where if they came down and they just, you know, maybe they're just curious, like, how do I become a pilot? Owen could tell them every detail about that, um, as well as, you know, if they wanted to schedule a lesson, they could talk to Owen right there and schedule a lesson at Vermont Flight Academy in Burlington. Um, as well as letting their kids sit in a really cool Citabria aircraft. So, um, you know, that, that's kind of our goal is we want to get people down there. And, and, and to be perfectly honest, you know, my personal goal is I want to be able uh, for, our, I want our organization to be able to contribute to uh, STEM aviation education in Vermont and career growth in Vermont. And so um, this, the aviation sector is, is going to be flush with jobs that are well-paying um, and we want to give the folks, the kids really that are interested in that, the opportunity to um, have a pathway to those careers. And we wanna to contribute to that uh, to help them. So that, that's really what our goals are uh, for these events and how we've been conducting them. And we, we hope to grow these events you know, um, uh, to a, a larger scale than we've already done. You know, we, we, we estimate we had about 1,000 to 1,200 people in Rutland for our events on June 12th. Um, and in Franklin County, the uh, week before, I think we had about seven or 800. So there's clearly an appetite for this. And, um, you know, we want to give the local Vermont residents everything that they need to satisfy that appetite. Those are very good numbers. Uh, and about the Franklin County uh, Airport event, uh, did you have an exhibition about the history of aviation in Vermont or working on something about that? So, um, we didn't necessarily have an exhibit, but we did bring some antique aircraft um, and we had those on static display. So everybody could go up and, you know, uh, sit in the plane and, you know, play around with the flight controls, take some pictures. Um, and everybody was allowed to do that and welcomed and encouraged to do that. So there, there were folks, you know, the event was four hours and there were folks getting in and out of those planes with their kids all day long. So it really paid off. Uh, we had an old Antonov uh, from Beta that they they um, they sponsored the event and let us bring that aircraft up from uh, the mid 1940s, and so that's you know considered an antique, and it's a really amazing airplane. It's just such a cool aircraft. Um, you won't see those almost anywhere in the U.S. And Beta is just such a huge aviation supporter and advocate that they brought it up, and so that was wonderful. 
Um, but we do plan on having more aircraft on display for every event for people to see. That's great. I remember as a child going to Floyd Bennett Field and uh, seeing the planes there and going actually in the cockpit. But that no. was ancient history. That was way ancient. But you still, you still remember it. I know? do. A a absolutely. Yeah. Um, one thing I just want to ask you about, uh, I, I know there's uh, some geography here, north, south, east, west, and uh, some parts of the state are accessible or not accessible or more scenic than others. Just tell us about how that plays into flying and things. Yeah, so, um, you know, that, so Vermont has a very interesting and unique um, topography. As everyone knows, we've got a, a ton of great mountains for skiing and hiking and lakes and rivers and, and everything. So that's, that's one of the huge attractions of Vermont. That's part of the reason my wife and I moved here and why everyone that is lucky enough to grow up here loves Vermont and wants to stay here. Um, as far as how that affects flying, it's, it's interesting. So Burlington International Airport is you know, I would say one of the easier airports to fly into because it's there are some mountains on the approach end for uh, one of the runways. Um, but for the most part, it's a it's a flat entry to the runway. So it's, it's fairly easy to approach. But then you have airports like um, Middlebury Airport, where it's very close to some mountains. And so you have to stay on one side, the western side of the airport to land. Um, and they currently don't have any instrument approaches, although we'd like to change that, um, uh, you know, with our organization would like to get that changed. But in Rutland's another example, you know, we're very close to the mountains. So you have to be comfortable with, you know, flying fairly close to the mountains and being aware of how the wind uh, travels over the mountains and how that could affect your aircraft during flight. So um, it is something where if you're going to fly in Vermont, you need to, it's nothing, um, you know, overly to, to be overly concerned about. You just have to be aware of your surroundings as you are anytime you're flying an aircraft and just understand how uh, the mountains will affect your flight and um, how to best approach that. So that, that's kind of the uh, major considerations when flying in a mountainous state. I, I know you mentioned uh, one or two businesses, but you have received some corporate or business support from various sectors of the state. Would you like to mention some of those people? Yeah, no, that, thank, thank you for bringing that up, Dennis. Um, so at the moment, we haven't um, um, proactively seeked any sponsors yet. Now, that will change once our website is up. But uh, we have a lot of uh, companies that just want to help out and support because they see the value of the aviation sector to not only their businesses, but to the communities. So we have um, a number of sponsors already. And these are all sponsors that we didn't really um, go out looking for, but we've partnered with. So uh, one is Cape Air. So Cape Air flies from Rutland to Boston and back three times a day. So if anybody didn't know that, um, you now know that you can get to uh, Boston from Rutland uh, three times a day, which is really nice because uh, there's no charge for parking at Rutland Airport. And anybody that's ever driven to Boston knows that it's a different story in Boston. Um, parking can be anywhere from 30 to $50 a day, depending on where you park. So that's really nice. So they've, uh, they're sponsoring all six of our events at Rutland, which is really great. Um, we also have another local uh, company in the Rutland area uh, called Browns Auto Salvage. And they've, uh, they're have they a financial sponsor for the season uh, for our events in Rutland. So um, they're a great organization that wants to support the aviation sector. Uh, and then we have a number of local, um, or well, not just local, but local and regional aviation companies who are supporting us by donating products. So for example, Wheel and Aerospace Technologies is based in Connecticut, and they've been donating um, LED landing lights for aircraft that we can use for raffles. So we've been raffling off one of their LED landing lights at every event, and those landing lights are worth uh, $300. So it's a, it's a pretty substantial donation they've given us. Uh, we, Green Mountain Avionics is one of the leading avionics service companies and equipment companies in the United States. They're based at Middlebury Airport. And they've donated avionic services packages to for us to raffle at our, our events for pilots. And that's a huge value. And then our local um, maintenance shop at Rutland Airport, SD Air Service, which is run by Scott Draper, um, they've donated aircraft oil changes for uh, us to raffle off at events. So we've gotten a ton of support from local and regional businesses uh, in the aviation sector and outside the aviation sector because they realize the value of having a, a strong and thriving aviation sector in the state of Vermont. That's great. Well, thank you very much, Ryan, sure. uh, my guest. And certainly we're going we're to have you back in, in the near future uh, when, when things occur and uh, you, you're looking for more public interest and support. And uh, 
Uh, this has been very, uh, very excellent interview, and thank you. And uh, my guest today has been Ryan Bliss, the president of the Vermont Aviators Association here on Positively Vermont. This is Dennis McMahon. Thank you for watching.